thank you for your introduction, Andrew, and welcome to everybody here tonight. It's fantastic to see such a wonderful turnout. Um, it's a rare opportunity indeed to have such fantastic, um, well-informed and diverse speakers here tonight, and I'm honoured to be presenting them to you. Commencing our speeches tonight will be Janelle Saffin, um, and this will be followed by Pyo Zerdo, who is a recently elected member of the Myanmar Parliament. Um, we will also be hearing from Sanda Min uh, and ANU's own, Janam, um, ANU's own Jane Ferguson and Nicholas Farrelly. Um, due to the number of speakers here tonight, we will only be taking a question or two after each speaker, so hold on to your questions till the end, we'll have some extended question time then. Also, if you need the bathroom, they're just through these doors underneath the clock. Um, now, to introduce our first speaker for tonight. Janelle Safran is Australian Federal MP with a long history of promoting democracy, education and health in Myanmar. She has been a major force in shaping Australia's Myanmar policy and went to Myanmar with Australia's Foreign Minister, then Foreign Minister Kevin Rudd, last year and met Aung San Suu Kyi again after 10 years. She is also Chair of the International Party Development Committee for International Labour. Please welcome Janelle Safran. Thanks very much, Jessie. Thanks very much, Jessie. And um, I know you mentioned that I went to Burma with Kevin Rudd. I say Kevin Rudd went to Burma with me. So <laughs> I describe it differently, <laughs> given my long involvement with Burma. And tonight, because there are so many speakers, and I think the stars tonight um, are actually our NLD MPs, so we're going to hear from them and have questions to them and we've agreed to keep our comments short, you know, to a few minutes because this is just such a rare opportunity. But look, what I would like to say is that uh, the visit here with the three National League for Democracy MPs and one other senior NLD member who's gone home it was hosted by Labor International, and as Jessie said, I chair the International Party Development Committee. And somebody said to me, they said, was it for other MPs from Burma, other people? And I said, yes, it will be, but given that the NLD have struggled for some nearly 24 years, I said they were entitled to have first go and have spot, five spots at the table, and I know nobody would begrudge that. But the MPs themselves said it was such a good opportunity doing the political advisors course coming to Canberra, to Parliament, that they want all the MPs and all the senior political party people in Burma to share that experience. And also, um, I'd just like to acknowledge Peter Yates, my colleague sitting here, the executive officer with Labor International, who's been doing the organising, looking after, as well as doing all the sort of head work. So to make it a success. Now with those words, what I'd like to say is that in Burma, it's a political landscape that's fraught with so many challenges. And yes, there's a lot from the past, but we have to focus now on the future, not forgetting the past. And in terms of, in 2008, I said to the then Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, I said, I want us to have a changed engagement in Burma. I want us to have a formal engagement, a changed engagement, where we say what our expectations are and we expect changes and let's set about making a bit of a difference. And that was what we did and I've been involved at that level, at policy level, ever since. And there have been some changes but it's still fraught. And I just want to read you a quote. And this is a quote from uh, someone who is uh, an actor in terms of political actor, but an historian, Than Min U, and he says, the Burmese Civil War is the longest running armed um, conflict in the world and has continued in one form or another from independence to the present day. 
The gun has never been taken away from Burmese politics and no government has governed the entirety of Burma since 1941. Elections have never been held across the entire country and no government has been able to conduct a proper census. Few border regions are even today free of rebel control. And his comment about elections have never been held across the entire country, that was true even in the by-election on the 1st of April. There were 48 constituencies, there were three where there weren't elections in Kachin State because the government said they felt they should not happen there. That was also contested and it's always been like that in Burma. That's just one of the many challenges. One of the other challenges is how do we engage now when some changes have happened, some transition is underway, but it's still a very contested environment. It's a contested landscape. It's a contested constitution. And all of those issues are issues that we have to grapple with. And one area where I've had a lot of engagement, apart from the political, is in the legal. And the changes to legal reform have been slow. So we've seen some political changes. We've seen some changes with uh, business environment. Not a lot, but legal reform, very slow. And I just want to give you a snapshot of what still can happen in Burma. Illegal arrest, illegal detention, uh, illegally obtained confession, closed trials, contradictory evidence, omitted evidence, inadmissible evidence, denial of right to defence. Now some of those things still happen, so there's a long way to go. We have to do some work on the rule of law. Everybody says we want the rule of law, from the USD party to the NLD, all the other parties, but there's not a lot of work happening in that space at the moment, and that's one of the areas that I'm very focused and engaged in and trying to assist some changes. And there are many good things happening, but we have to keep a watching brief. And we've just eased sanctions on Burma from Australia's perspective, and some people I know, even people here, would object to that. And I again got asked the question, I said I have some apprehension about it, but sanctions are in place so that when changes happen we can start to remove them, but we keep a watching brief to make sure that we don't go backwards um, in that space. Look, they're really the only comments I want to make. I don't want to give a major presentation or a major speech, but I just wanted to give some opening remarks to help set the scene and um, really um, allow you to have more time with our visiting um, colleagues, our NLD MPs. And thank you, Jessie, for organising. Thank you, Peter, as well. Uh, for supporting and thank you everybody for coming out tonight. It's just wonderful. It's a great crowd. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janelle. Um, and I look forward to seeing what Australia's relationship with Myanmar holds. Our next speaker released his first hip hop album at the age of 19, I think, and held the number one spot in Burma's pop charts for a couple of months. So um, he was also one of the four founding members of Generation Wave, a prominent youth movement agitating for change in Burma. The group was formed shortly after the Saffron Revolution, which was in 2007, and circulated anti-government media. Um, unlike other pop artists and film distributors, Pure Theathor was only last year released from three and a half years in jail for his activities. On April the 1st, he was elected to the lower house of Myanmar's parliament. Please welcome Pyong Tse Tho. Thank you, Jesse. The writing is not three and a half years, only three years and three months. That's all. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I take the opportunity to introduce myself. My name is Pyong Tse Tho. However, most of, most of my colleagues call me Zia, you can call me so. I was born in Rangoon, Burma. I used to be a singer. My band name is Acid, and I was introduced to music 
in Bonn since 1997. So, during my musical career, I have had more exposure with people from all walks of life, especially with the basic struggle of population. I also heard about the voices of the people, of their suffering, especially of their social economic problems. So, as you know, the artist's heart was you know, very sensitive of suffering. So, who are uh, facing with a social economic struggle? I can stand it. Because we live in the same country, we live in the, in the same area. So, I got, if the people are pain, I feel pain. If the people are angry, I felt same too. That's why I was interested in politics. This is where, when I was involved in the politics. So, when I was interested in, in the politics, at first I started to contact with the people who were doing the political activities. Say, it's being like a you know, 88 generation student who started the general shock at the during the 1988. And then later four of my friends are uh, including me, we, we get up and we organize with a group, young advocate group named as Generation Point. In 2007, we got Southern Revolution. The Generation Wave deeply involved in the, in the Southern Revolution. After this, I was detained by the military intelligence and they sentenced me six years for that. And I was sent a very far remote person in the, uh, called the, the southernmost part of Burma, the, the Till of Burma. And I was released at May 2011. And so, after I released, I start to join the NLD because NLD is the one and only party who can direct me to the democratic way. So that's why I joined the NLD and I put all of my assets to the to the lady and the NLD party. And also, I found a, you know, a CSO group just named as Gunlet. It, it means the helping hand, which for relief and support to the natural disaster area. And in the meantime, NLD executive committee decided me to take part of the, this by-election. Representing from the Nebido, at the uh, it's so-called Nebido, the, the agenda bill, the CD. So now I'm elected as a member of the representation of the Nebido Obadiri Township. So that's all of my career. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks for your attention. I'm with, I'm sorry sorry for this. You know we can be prepared for. For better speech, because we don't have enough time and we are traveling so many places, so that's why we don't have to plan or we don't have to write so many things. So, so thanks for your attention. That's all. Thank you for a wonderful speech. Um, Next, we have AMU's own Dr. Jane Ferguson. Uh, Jane Ferguson did her PhD on the area that she's going to be speaking about tonight, um, and that is uh, the current situation and geographical, geographically peripheral power holders in Myanmar. And those areas in the northeast are the Shan Insurgency and Wa ceasefire groups, and the struggles for sovereignty that are happening or have happened there. Um, so I'll pass you over to Jane.
Thank you, Jesse. Um, I'm delighted to see what uh, a very diverse and interesting group here, and uh, welcome. I look forward to your questions. I'm going to be talking about one specific area of um, Burmese politics, and I realize that it's just um, one piece of a much larger puzzle, but I thought it would be useful to give um, a bit of context here, because it does tend to be an area which has been um, unfortunately overlooked to some extent um, by the major news articles that have been coming out about the changes in uh, Burma, Myanmar over the past couple of years. And so I originally I titled this Possibilities for Peace in the Northeast with a specific focus on the Shan State Army South and the United Gua State Army. Um, as mentioned already, this is one of the longest running internal conflicts in modern history, and its statistics are quite sobering in that since there have been people taking up arms against the central government on the brink of independence, and the conflict continues uh, to this day. So the Northeast, the Shan State, is the, geographically the largest area and also ethnically one of the most diverse. If any of you has been to the largest city in the south of the Shan State, in Taunji, they have a um, Shan Nationalities Museum where they actually have a poster listing all of the names of the different ethnic groups. And there's even ethnic groups that only have one person in them. You've got to wonder how lonely it must be to be um, your own ethnic group, as it were. But in any case, the Shan, the largest ethnic group of the area, has um, been in insurgency under different names um, from the Numsa Khan in uh, 1958 up into the um, various uh, Shan groups that exist today, some of which are ceasefire groups. Importantly as well, um, both red and white flag insurgencies of the um, Burmese Communist Party and the Communist Party of Burma have long been active, as were the Kuomintang, um, Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang, up until the early 80s. Importantly, following the 1988 uprisings, which um, we've been already given some mention to, uh, the Communist Party of Burma mutinied, and there were four splinter groups, one of which resulted in the United Wa State Army, um, so it became a red flag communist group and then became an ethnic insurgency. And the head of military intelligence, Kim Yun, orchestrated a ceasefire arrangement with the United Wa State Army, giving them territorial sovereignty and also trade privileges. So gradually, the United Wa State Army became the strongest non burman um, armed force in Burma and currently they command about um, 20,000 troops, and its uh, uh, activities were supported by um, methamphetamine trade and uh, bootlegged uh, Chinese uh, movies and DVDs down to the Burma-Thai border. But importantly, at this point, uh, prior to the 2010 elections, they broke with the ceasefire arrangement, and there were extreme tensions because they did not want to become a border guard force to the um, Burmese Tecmodal. And also, um, they were made use of as a ceasefire group in order to fight against the Shan State Army in the Shan State. And I'm realizing I'm getting into maybe a bit too much detail um, when we're talking about um, grand ideas, so um, I'll try to hold off from being my usual academic lecturer mode and go back and then just think about maybe four serious political um, concerns that we should think about when we're thinking about a peaceful future for specifically the Shan state and these border area concerns. Um, uh, first of all, the conversion of ceasefire groups, the former Nyingchangye Akwe, into border guard forces. To what extent will these ceasefire groups who had former autonomy become come into the fold of the Burmese military, which still is the largest employer in the country and the largest military force in the country. And second of all, what is the relationship between territorial sovereignty and economic development that's talked about? And how can the international community think about um, these areas? Who's sovereign and who are we going to cooperate with when we talk about investment and development? Um, the fact also that ceasefire groups have not 
um, refrained from engaging in armed conflict and the humanitarian issues that these raise for villagers who are either recru recruited into armed groups or end up um, displaced as, um, as refugees or migrants. And then finally, thinking about the Shan state as the geographically largest area um, territory within Burma, Myanmar, what is the relationship between um, security and the long border that it shares with um, Thailand and China as well? Um, so perhaps four all too sobering um, questions, but there is wine on the table that we can um, drink for a while and get revved up and think about how we can put the hopes and the ideals that have been talked about, about the changes with Burma, Myanmar recently, and then think about ways in which there might be um, uh, avenues for positive support for the, from the international community to the people of Burma. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, our next speaker has had a big year. Uh, a year ago, she was released from prison after serving four and a half years out of a 65-year sentence and for her involvement in the 2007 Saffron Revolution process. Um, though this was only one of many periods of incarceration, I believe. Um, Sandra Lim is a general ma manager of a bakery, uh, a chemistry law and bi business graduate, and a mother. On the 1st of April, she was also elected as a National League for Democracy parliamentarian. Please welcome Sandra Lim. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, I would like to say, uh, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Sandami, and I'm accompanied by my follow-up, Gokyo Ziyato and Gokyo Mite. We are all recently elected MP from Myanmar in the April by elections. Uh, I would like to uh, give you uh, some my country historic support for uh, our journey. Uh, some of them are known, some of them are they don't know. That's why uh, I would like to speak a little bit. So, from 1990, on board the military gender, uh, Papa Dia said central government in control through main uh, manipulations and distract. During the time of the military government, uh, the National General Assembly they held in 1993, uh, 2003, 2004, and 2007. On that September 2007, the General Assembly was concluded and in 2008, new constitutions crafted by the military was finalized and endorsed. And even though an election was held in 2010, uh, NLD party did not contest for any seats as the electoral term terms and conditions mandate are as acceptable as well as our leaders of the party. Uh, Dr. Aung San Suu Kyi was under the house arrest. Uh, many of us were also in prison because of our earlier political convictions. In 2010 elections, the military government backed party uh, USDP won the majorities of the seats and formed the new government. The elections was criticized by the international community as unfair and unjust. That's why in November, in November 2010, Do Aung San Suu was released from her house events. However, from 2011, the military government transformed into a civilian government and began the new steps towards political reform. After her release, the president, you can say, started a dialogue with the Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, released majorities of the political prisoners, as well as me, and reduced the restrictions of media. The most important electoral law was amended for the by-elections and we, the NLD party, have 
decided to contest. On of 400 seats at the parliament, 48 seats which were occupied by the current government, he gave vacant and a bond elections was held on 1st April 2012. Even though there were 48 vacant seats, Emily only contacts for the 45 constituency due to the civil conflicts in the Kachin states where the other three constituency area. Our party wants 44 seats out of 45, but one seat was rejected by the authorities as the representative was a non myanmar nationality. Mm. This left a total of 43 seats won by our party of NLD. White Tiger Party also won seats uh, representing uh, constituencies in the Sham states. All members of these dialogue, these delegations, Uziyato, Kokyomite, and myself, forgot in various capacities for the democracies in our country and have been recently elected in the by-elections. We appreciated that there is so much to learn. We are very grateful for the opportunity to study the art of politics and democracies from a country like Australia, which we considered and look at as the most robust democratic country in the region. Although this is a short program, we want to stress that this is a truly a great opportunity for us. Uh, I also believe that that will support of our future relations between ALP and LLD. We also hope that ALP can help our party and the peoples of Myanmar by sharing experience and providing specialist advice to achieve a true and greater democracy in our country. Uh, I would like to conclude it by welcoming ALP to work together in a partnership with our country and thanks everyone for providing us with this opportunity. And then that's all. Thank you very much for our audience. Thank you very much, Sandan. Um, our final speaker for tonight is Dr. Nicholas Farrelly. Dr. Farrelly is the co-founder of the successful and informative new Mandela website. He is also a Rhodes Scholar and a highly sought after commentator on Burmese and Thai issues. Um, so please welcome Dr. Nicholas Farrelly. Good evening ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to pay tribute to Jessica Avalon and the Asia Pacific Learning Community for organising this evening's wonderful event. I've got to say, I've been doing this for a while now, and this must be the best attended Myanmar politics discussion I have ever seen. So, congratulations. It, it is quite simply a credit to all of you who've come along on, on such a cold camera evening, and in particular, it is a great tribute uh, to the recently elected National League for Democracy representatives who of course carry with them the great hopes of the people of Myanmar. It is a truly beautiful early winter evening in Canberra when we can benefit from their unfiltered insights. And with that preamble out of the way, it's my unenviable duty to follow such distinguished speakers. They've already provided us with much analytical insight and fresh information. And in the hope of leading us into a fruitful question and answer session, let me offer you a few of my own very brief and also somewhat critical observations about what might happen next in Myanmar. In Myanmar today, there is an understandable urge to see everything change. Right now. With the 43 National League for Democracy representatives endorsed by the people to take part now in the official political conversation, there are of course reasons for great optimism. Nobody, I think, can remember a time when Myanmar's people would dare to dream like they can today. And not just dream, but vote, debate, 
scrutinise, you name it. I think, though, that there are reasons to consider the prospects to change with at least one eye on the problems that might lurk just over the horizon. So to fertilise our discussion and the question and answer session to follow, um, let me introduce four areas where I think that Burma's government, whether led by President Wu Tensei or by President Duo Aung San Suu Kyi, will need to work with diligence, goodwill and savvy. This is going to be a road with countless obstacles and hidden dangers. First on my list, there is the issue of demilitarising elite politics. Perhaps we saw the very first signs of this when one of the Vice Presidents, a former General and a decorated combat commander by the name of Tin Hong Min U, stepped down from his post just a few days ago. Maybe other senior figures, to include most of the President's Cabinet, dare I say it, will one day be replaced by civilians too. In Myanmar, this process of demilitarisation will need to be extensive. It will, I'd suggest, last at least a generation. No country in Southeast Asia has, in fact, completely taken the military out of politics, and there are some countries you'd all appreciate in the immediate neighbourhood, such as Thailand, where history offers warnings about the uniquely destabilising potential of a coup-prone army. Myanmar definitely doesn't want to go down that path. So, second, if Myanmar hopes to avoid that path, it needs to find more productive outlets for the energy of the army's 400,000 sub troops. Killing Kachin, sorry to be crude, in the reignited war in northernmost Myanmar is hardly the way forward. And my humble suggestion to the President is to declare a unilateral ceasefire, take armed force off the agenda and get all the Kachin to the negotiating table. The President should, at least in my mind, lead the negotiations himself. In Myanmar, ending inter-ethnic war is a President's job. I also guess there is a Nobel Peace Prize waiting for whoever can finally bring Burma's many warring ethnic groups into peaceful coexistence. Third, there is the problem of grinding poverty that is present in so many of the country's regions. Myanmar is, as our colleagues from the NLD appreciate better than most, still a very, very poor place. Its economy needs injections of capital and will also benefit if some of the millions of Burmese scattered to the four corners of the world decide that things back home are good enough that they can try their luck there. Economic transformation over the years ahead will be just as important as the political reforms that we are celebrating today. Fourth, there is the need for national reconciliation. Truth and reconciliation will, in Myanmar's case, go hand in hand. Accounting for the horrors of the past will be an absolutely crucial step forward. 1988, 2007 and all the rest to include those many years wasted when Myanmar's prisons were filled with prisoners' of conscience. Among ethnic minorities in particular, peace will only come with justice and the ceasefire stalemates that perhaps have prevailed over the years will now need to be followed by genuine peace. So these four issues, demilitarisation of elite politics, ethnic war, poverty and truth and reconciliation will I think loom very large for many years to come. And there's also a chance I think we should raise it on occasions like this however modest it may be, that factions in the armed forces will disavow the reformist instincts of the President and his close advisers. A coup would be absolutely disastrous, and that's the very last thing that Myanmar needs right now. I think it's only through working the messy politics, the messy participation, that things will improve. And so, on that note, a somewhat sombre note, um, 
I'd suggest that our questions and the answers that we will hear this evening um, will give us impressions of what looms just over the horizon for the people of Myanmar. Um, it's a credit to the many Burmese who have joined us this evening um, that their country is heading in such a positive direction. Hope, I think, has returned and we will, of course, all be wishing them the very best of luck. Thank you.